good morning oh, from Rocabar Trogranati. A good afternoon from, for those who are joining us from China. I would like to present where we are here in Spain, in Roca Barcelona Gallery. Roca Galleries are buildings that would like to connect uh, professionals from the architecture, design, with people interested in design, sustainability, management, innovation, uh, throughout events, exhibitions, and other meetings. You can also find Roca Galleries in Madrid, Lisbon, London, Shanghai, Beijing, and um, very soon in Sao Paulo. We are very excited of this new opening. Today, thanks to the Foundation Mies van der Rohe, and with the collaboration of XGTL University and Roca, our company with more than 100 years of expertise, expertise designing, producing, and manufacturing sanitary wear products, uh, we are celebrating the third meeting between China and Europe following the topic of the super blocks and public space. Here we have the expert, Van Blasi, from uh, uh, the Miss <laughs> Foundation Miss Van der Rohe, and uh, Yvette Gasol from Theatre Studio. Thanks all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Raquel. And we wish to welcome today all the people that are uh, here in Roca Barcelona Gallery. We're also uh, showing this uh, via YouTube. And we are also very happy to also come with the director of the Mies van der Rohe Foundation, Ana Ramos, who is also with us following this, and obviously with Yvette, but also uh, with all of you over there in Shanghai and Beijing, Roca Galleries, uh, together with all the team from the uh, LJ, uh, sorry, X, um, uh, XJTLU uh, University. Uh, where we have Davide Lombardi and Jose Ramon, who are also the ones that have made it possible to have the exhibition that we're showing in the Shanghai Rocket Gallery, together with the videos of the EU Mies Awards 2022 in both galleries. So, on the one hand, the EU Mies Awards have been uh, delivered and have been organized uh, in a collaboration with the European Union since 1988, and together with obviously uh, celebrating architecture and the uh, buildings and projects of public space, urbanism and landscape that are uh, the winners. Uh, what's also very, very important is that from the discussions of the jury members, of the nominators, the experts, and all those people throughout Europe that uh, discuss on the projects, the more recent projects of European contemporary architecture, that we can also share this debate, this discussion with everyone throughout Europe, but also uh, further away, which means in the Americas, in Africa, in Asia, and so on. So this has been a really good opportunity for us uh, to collaborate on the one hand with the university, because uh, the EU Mies Awards this year is also organizing the young talent. So every other two years, the prize is not for built pieces of work architecture, but for final diploma projects from all over Europe, and sometimes also with uh, the guest countries which are invited to participate. This year we're doing it with African countries. So we're also very interested in adding to this discussion what happens in schools, what happens in this threshold between students which have already become professionals and they are starting their careers from different points of view as we know uh, we can follow uh, in architecture. So uh, we want to uh, kind of also thank the university for uh, having uh, organized this exhibition in uh, Shanghai uh, Rocket Gallery we were, where we're showing the 40 shortlisted works from among which there are the finalists and there's also the two winners, one of them being the Kingston University Town House building in London by Grafton Architects and the Emerging Architect which was in 2022 uh, La Borda, uh, operative housing by La Col Arquitectes here in Barcelona. So today we're live also from Barcelona, from Roca Gallery, which was designed by Carlos Farraté and the OAB architecture firm, which has also participated with many of their works in the EU MIAS Awards. And we're opening this debate, this discussion today, after doing it on the profession and also on educational challenges in the two previous meetings that we've had in discussions with Shanghai and Beijing today on public space and specifically the notion or the idea of the superblocks. So we have different uh, guests, but I would like to ask Davide, Davide uh, from uh, Beijing to also uh, join us and uh, share some words with our audiences. 
Davide Lombardi. It's been, of course, a uh, deep pleasure for Xianjiatong Liverpool University, the design school and the Department of Architecture, which I represent to join our forces with uh, Roca Gallery and the Miss Van der Rohe Foundation. This has been uh, uh, three intense weeks over which we have been discussing the topics of uh, relationship between education and architecture or professional practice. And today we come to a conclusion with the public spaces and the super blocks. It has been uh, an intense period of preparation in order to make sure that everything in Shanghai via the um, exhibition was going to be smooth and properly displayed of the work you guys do there in, in Barcelona and in the foundation. Uh, I'm very proud of this and uh, I do hope that this is the first step of a sequence of future events which will basically encompass our uh, also international nature of the, our university merging China, Europe, Spain and uh, even more via the guests that we have today and that we have had which are all coming from different countries, different backgrounds, different professional and professional backgrounds. So again, I am very happy to be here again for the third time, for the second time out of three, actually. And now I'll pass over to Jose in Shanghai. Thank you very much, Davide. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the audience who came here to Shanghai, also the people in Beijing and everybody who is in Barcelona. Um, I would like to introduce a little bit our guest and that we have a, an amazing panel today. We have uh, Jan Klosterman in, in Beijing uh, from Clow Studio. We have Yvette Gasol in Barcelona from Cierto Architects. And here with me is San San Chi. Um, San San is an architect uh, who was studying in the US. She was in Columbia University. She got her degree there. Then she did her master in Harvard, if I'm right. Um, finally, she got her PhD with the Pritzker uh, Prize Wansu. And right now she is teacher uh, in the University of uh, Arts in Hangzhou. And also since 2013, she is uh, a director of her own office, uh, Studio T in Hangzhou. But I think she will introduce her better, so I leave the pass to her. You can start your presentation. Okay, five minutes, very quickly. Um, I'll talk about what's super block, especially in China, and what we as architects, especially young architects, as a continuing understanding uh, what's different from super block and what we can do nowadays. And of course, we have to start with the Renku houses, uh, SML, XLs, uh, the article, the Asian cities of tomorrow, where he sort of defines the scale of a super block and uh, the mixed interwoven um, programs of a super block, which has to be efficient. It's almost described as this new utopian, which can resolve many problems that we, as urban conditions, are, are rising. Um, but what defines super block in China is quite different. Um, due to our own sort of recent history and the social movements. So from 1949 to the 80s, when I was born, um, we, we called it Dan Wei. So, so Dan Wei is as this uh, sort of national realm uh, organization or working company units, like these big factories. Um, so you have more than 1,000 people at least, or even 10,000 people with their family. So you have to have, um, so, so this is one Dan Wei. Uh, one Dan Wei is one working unit, but it's a super gigantic working unit where you do have kindergarten, you have um, social, social areas, you have um, all different sort of uh, public programs that has to serve so it's like small little cities. Um, um, but then it's um, after the 80s, um, as I was growing as a kid, I, I literally see these downways are being sort of being demolished. And many of my parents' friends, they were working there and they basically got job lost. So this is sort of the period of the first periods of uh, Superblocks has been over. And then what's taking it? It's, it's 
really the even larger super blocks that are usually uh, bigger than 500 meter by 500 meter. Sometimes it's one kilo by one kilo. You can see that all over um, in many cities, in Shenzhen, in Beijing, um, and they were built because of the economic boom and uh, um, from the private housing, um, so that you can buy housing unit, but without any. Um, public program or public space whatsoever. There's no kindergarten, there's no hospital, there's no shopping around. So it's just housing unit and that which creates a lot of problems, it's sort of unhealthy. And we call it what's um, from top to bottom. So it's all from these regulations. So because of these problems, um, and we have been having uh, actually uh, official regulations to, to say that, no more super blocks, and the, and the, the largest that you can build is smaller than four, 400 meter by 400 meter. So that is a official definition for what super blocks in, in China. But now, as as young architects here, and we don't, we, we were really talking about super blocks when we were in school, but now we don't talk it anymore because it has so many problems. And we're trying to uh, really looking back to what's a good living and a fun living and all these cultural and historical way of uh, Chinese living, you know, what is a Chinese life in a way? So we are really looking back into the countryside or what we call the Xiangchun. So that, this is a new definition that we're rising. So we are really working um, outside of urban, these super blocks to look into what defines the new public space. Um, so what is also, we come up with the name of Suji. Suji is a definition, like Ming Suji Chun, Suji. So Suji is um, that urban people wants to get away from, uh, let's say Shanghai, and wants to go to the countryside and wants to live there for, for over a long time period of time. And then uh, they're being uh, creating lots of hotels and living units over there, but without uh, public space. So Suji is to providing public space even in those countrysides. So it's not new development, but it's more, more or less like a new utopian way of living. And we're still testing. And what programs should be adding in like galleries? Do we need bookstores? Do we need uh, small restaurants? Do we need... Um, any of these programs, etc. So these are the projects that have been um, working on since 2017. And this is the uh, Suji near uh, Yellow River. Uh, so there are many, many, many different public spaces uh, amount living units. And they're very interwoven that from, from top down, you can't really tell what's public and what's private in a way. Um, and of course, there are camel walking around and we're living with animals and etc. And this is a Suji in uh, Songyang, uh, near my hometown. Uh, th th this is a mountain condition. So I'm presenting different types of conditions. This is the project I've been working on uh, in, in Yangtze River site. And um, this is their living units. And uh, they're being living units with different, different programs. And uh, this is another Suji in Zhejiang province. Since I only have five minutes, I'm just quickly showing. And this is also near the ocean. Okay, so, so there are museum and, and galleries and uh, um, any program that you can think of. And it's really uh, interwoven and mixed. And uh, th this is in Tibet. Uh, so we're also introducing, uh, really working with the village there and trying to make the village more or less like a, uh, not just house, houses. We're, we're not just developing hotels and living units, but really trying to make it a connection between urban people and, and uh, people who are living there. So this is the uh, sort of a, a cluster that I'm building there um, in Tibet. Mm -hmm. This is another cluster that I'm building in Basongchuo village. So it, it's an existing village, but we are adding more programs, more private and more public programs that are trying to interwove with these already exist areas. So this is my quick sort of share with all. Thank you very much, Sun Sun. Now we are going to move to Beijing. Thanks. Thanks, Jose. So here in uh, Beijing with me, we have uh, Ian Klosserman, which is a German architect. He has an educational background in Berlin 
uh, TU Berlin and then uh, Architectural Association in London. So we can say it's a quite a European background. However, he moved to China in 2005, so it's almost 20 years. So I'm sure he has quite a good, big understanding of uh, the local context and the, and the topic we are going to discuss today. And he founded Clue Architects in 2015 now. So we can open his presentation and I leave the floor to Ian. Thank you very much, David. It's really great. So um, we have offices everywhere where Rocker is almost in Beijing, Shanghai, and, um, and, and Lisbon. We uh, operate in the fields of architecture, city planning, um, and interiors. Just a second, sorry. Uh, okay, so, of course, when I came, when I came to, um, when I came to China, it's unavoidable to work, to work on uh, super blocks. I, I like cities very much. In Germany, I grew up um, in a village. And um, so I love being in a big city where there's always something different going on and where you can always find something new where, you know, nobody knows you, but also where you can meet different types of people uh, all the time. And also there's stuff going on all the time. But of course, when you come to Beijing, what we found is you can, uh, as Shan Shan said, you can walk for 400 meters and maybe you have one entrance and then you walk for another 400 meters have another entrance. So there's a kind of lack of this streetscape exactly because of this tradition of the of the Dunway which had everything inside. So this problem of um, actually opening up uh, blocks and we work in, uh, we do quite a lot of mixed use projects, commercial, um, even shopping malls. So we always thought about this problem um, of basically breaking up the box and making it more porous so that people can actually um, enjoy it and creating these uh, spaces where you sort of have a, a three-dimensional uh, streetscape. So something that rather than kind of going back to another typology, you sort of create a, a new typology that combines the density of cities that we need, but also creates a creates a spectacle that makes the, uh, the city um, open. So in our build work in, 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 in Chengdu, um, we, um, we built this mixed-use communities with uh, young apartments. And uh, our idea was kind of based on this uh, trinity of um, creating between the home and neighborhood um, and, the, and the market street, which is the street. So this is the street or the marketplace, and then we have these platforms above covering the street, which form the neighborhood, where both people that live there and people that walk through um, can meet, um, and basically create this very vibrant um, mixed, mixed community that is still open for, for walking through, but also offers a kind of different amenity to people who live there, but also different experience to people who just pass through. And in Shanghai, we've kind of found a different typology of, of opening up the super block, which is by raising part of this commercial volume, this, which is this uh, circle above, so that people can kind of walk through and uh, have this more uh, traditional, small scale um, spaces with, uh, with terraces and, um, and, and open space. So balancing um, big blocks and not then uh, this one, when you're really kind of building a big, big mall, then the idea is, or one recipe is actually that you open up the roof um, towards the uh, towards the city and making it accessible. So kind of giving back the public space that you occupy with the footprint of your building, integrating staircases, um, and kind of again creating a three-dimensional um, space. So this is a more recent. Uh, under development project. It's a massive 300 meter long building um, where these uh, these terraces on top become public as well um, and have um, have a function uh, with place where people can uh, can do sports. 
And um, that's yeah. another project quite similar. Mm -hmm. Again, it's sort of, a, it would be a block, but you can actually pass over it by going onto yeah. the roof, which is also accessible 24 yeah. hours to the city. And uh, you have this kind of park, and again, it's, it's different from a ground floor park. You can run on this uh, on this running wow. track no, through, no, the, no. through the sky, and then when you walk see, see, see. through the place again, also you we kind of created even for the interiors this kind of um, streetscape. Wow. So we're really kind of trying to find wherever possible ways of dealing with this <laughs> problem of the super block and making it um, less of a super block. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, thanks, Ian. And I'll pass over to Ivan and his guest, Yvette Gasol in Barcelona. Thank you very much. So I would like to ask also Yvette to join me. Uh, Yvette uh, Gasol uh, is an architect, uh, Yvette Gasol Ascoué, who founded or co-founded together with five partners. Uh, so there's six architects, uh, Cierto Estudio here in Barcelona. They also studied here in the city of Barcelona. And they've won and built and are uh, building uh, several uh, collective housing projects. And uh, they were also the winners of an important part of what we call the super block uh, idea here in Barcelona. We were aware that when we were speaking about superblock, there are different contexts where we come from, historical, social, economic, and political. So the notion of that was different during the modern movement, and it's also, as we're seeing, also different uh, in different places. So you will allow us from Barcelona to make it a bit different, and we'll do two presentations. I will start presenting uh, the idea of the superblock uh, from the point of view of the city, of the city council, of the city hall of Barcelona, which has been developing this uh, new idea or present idea and transformation of the city in the last, uh, let's say, seven uh, years approximately. And then I will give the word to Yvette uh, so that she can also explain her understanding of the general idea of the superblock understood here in Barcelona. Uh, and also their own uh, project before getting into the questions that we want to also speak about. So the first thing is that the size of the cities that we're speaking about, Shanghai or Beijing and Barcelona, is very different. Okay, you have 25 million people living in Shanghai. In the city of Barcelona, it's uh, 1.6 million in the smaller city, which you're seeing over here. But however, in the metropolitan area, and if we reach the uh, regional or provincial uh, area, the city grows quite a lot to around 3 million or even 5 million in, uh, in the more uh, provincial area. But what you see is that the density is much higher than uh, the general one of uh, Shanghai or Beijing. So we have around 15 thousand or 16,000 habit inhabitants per square kilometer uh, in the smaller uh, Barcelona, this one and a half million uh, city. And you see the evolution of the city since the second century, the Roman city, uh, we would say, uh, throughout the centuries and up till uh, today. So how we conceive it uh, has become also uh, very different and it is absolutely important uh, to take into consideration all these big infrastructures, the port, the airport, uh, train systems, uh, road systems, and then also the scale of uh, all of us, of, uh, of us. So understanding the small, large, and the metropolitan scale in order to understand all the challenges that there are. Because the challenges have to do with problems that are uh, visible every day, which means high levels of pollution, acoustic uh, pollution, house gas uh, effects. Uh, there is also the involvement of traffic accidents, and that considered uh, regarding who or uh, some other um, statistics and so on, uh, the city of Barcelona does not have enough green uh, areas. So there's been this since the uh, end of the Spanish dictatorship, a kind of discussion on how to transform the city and improve the city for uh, its inhabitants. And so uh, in the last years, this has continued uh, happening uh, with the aim of recovering public space, because we also will see, uh, or we need to understand, and that will be one of the first questions, how we understand public space. On the one hand, we understand that sidewalks, plazas, and so on are public space, but where there's cars, that's also public space, and also public museums or public institutions, those are also public spaces that we can all enjoy because they are part 
of the administrations that we choose, that we uh, discuss about, and in which we uh, also, as citizens, have something to say on their uh, use. So that would be uh, somehow a first step into speaking about public uh, spaces, improving public transport and diminishing uh, all these uh, issues regarding uh, pollution from the global scale to the urban scale and the scale of each one of us. So in this part, which we call the Eixample, which is this grid called the Sarda uh, part of the city, which was built or started, it was started built, uh, to be built uh, second half of the 19th century, there's these 100 meters time 100 meters approximately blocks uh, where there was a street on uh, each one of its four sides. And the idea of the Superblock Barcelona, which is already thinking about the whole city and not a single part of the city or so on, it's thinking about the metropolitan scale. That's why sometimes now it's not uh, used with the plural. It's Superblock Barcelona. And the idea is that cars or streets with cars are going to only use some of the streets, uh, but not all of them. And some of the streets will be transformed uh, so that they can be used by pedestrians and only the inhabitants or some people that need to use those spaces. And to make that work, instead of having continuous paths for cars going from one side of this super block, which could be composed of the three older uh, Eixample blocks, so in this case, in this drawing, it's a scheme, it's 300 meters times 300 meters, uh, cars have to turn around on each corner. So this does not make it kind of uh, interesting for people who want to cross the city in a faster way. Because one of the issues is also that many people cross the city of Barcelona without stopping in it. And this area of the Eixample is the one where there's more pollution, one of the most polluted areas, and where most of this traffic uh, goes through. So there were some first uh, proposals and that were uh, carried on. Uh, using um, well the urbanism, uh, tactical urbanism by painting and slowly seeing which could be the improvements of that. Uh, we're seeing some examples over here. And then some projects in which uh, finally the definitive form of uh, those proposals, like we're seeing over here around the marketplace called Sant'Antoni, uh, were built uh, using uh, materials that can last, furniture, uh, greenery, uh, and all these kind of elements that make up also our urban spaces. So it changed, as you were seeing in the previous slide, from a place where cars could just go along the streets to spaces in which uh, cars uh, need to find other ways around the city, but not along the areas which have been changed. And we're seeing some images of that first, or oh, those first tests, in Poplano and then here in Sant'Antoni. And, uh, well, looking at this uh, rethinking um, of the use of the streets, the sidewalks, and those spaces uh, in which cars uh, continue uh, going through, and thinking also at the global metropolitan uh, scale, uh, there are these drawings in which the importance of being able to walk from different points around the city, using public transport or using bicycles uh, has been kind of rethought and also trying to find which are the accesses or the streets that still cars uh, need uh, to go through uh, the city. And that's what's taking place right now, uh, so actually uh, being built and therefore there was a competition uh, to see how uh, a series of uh, these uh, areas uh, of uh, transformation in which, for example, here you see the crossing between several streets, which is approximately the same size as other public spaces that we have, plazas and so on, uh, in the city of Barcelona, how those could also be transformed into plazas, into spaces uh, prior with the priority for pedestrians, as we're seeing over here. And following these uh, competitions, which were not only uh, thought about in groups of blocks of uh, existing uh, housing that uh, we saw at the beginning, but also accesses, so uh, linear uh, transformations of streets, uh, with these images of how it could look like in the future. One of these competitions was won by Cierto uh, Estudio, and so we have 
Yvette to explain her experience, how she understands the notion of public space and this project of transformation of cities. So thank you very much, uh, Yvette. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. That was a perfect uh, introduction uh, to, to our project and the competition context and so on. Um, I don't know. So we're going to see the PDF now. OK, oh, there we go. Sorry. That's not the, the first image. Is it the last? No, no. The, okay. like the third one or so. Um, walking from the center was the title of our uh, comp competition proposal for this new green axis in the street of Consell de Sen in Barcelona. For those ones who don't know us, we are Cierto Studio, a team uh, founded by six uh, architects that, as he already mentioned, we all of us studied in, in Barcelona, in the Polytechnic School of Architecture. And this is uh, our team, uh, ten, 10 architects uh, that we mainly yeah, do social housing, uh, interior refurbishments, and now also urbanism, and hopefully someday also uh, public uh, services. And, and this is our space in Poblano, actually, next to the super, super block in Poblano. So we, bo we won this competition two years ago, uh, and, and now it's going to be uh, finished. Uh, actually, today is under construction, but uh, apparently in two months it will, will be finished. So it's actually a, quite a quick uh, project, no? so, uh, just two years for all the all the project and and the urban construction and and site so this was the virtual image for the competition and i'll try to be briefly and quick uh, ivan already mentioned that um, no, there was these uh, four streets to be uh, refurbished Consell de Seine was the, the, the only horizontal axis, and the other three ones were vertical. But this is the future plan of the green axis in, in the Eixample neighborhood. And it's a bit different. These are what the four streets that are, going, or are being uh, refurbished already. And this is a different conception in the in the superblock uh, Barcelona, no? As as he was explaining, it's not about uh, pacifying a big area anymore, but treating these spaces as a as an axis and using the street as the public space uh, to to change and dynamics and and so on, no? So uh, the green, the green one, UP one, is the one that we are developing already. The competition proposal, which was a bit different of uh, what in the end is is gonna end up, um, was about the the main goal was about to to lead the people walk from the center of the street. No? Now we. We have to walk uh, through, the, through the facades on the perimeter of that street. And the center is uh, just for, for buses and cars and so on. So that was the main change. And um, we proposed to magnify the, the green and the vegetation next to the facades. Uh, although that was a bit complicated because of the um, installations underneath and because of the blind people um, that uses the facade as a guideline for their um, for their works and and also we were proposing to have some some furniture no? um, more located in the center of the street. Those dashed lines uh, doing this zigzag uh, represent the, um, the lights, the public lights. 
uh, trying to locate them in the center as well of the street, no? giving this priority to, to that circulation. I'll, I'll go fast. You already seen this image of the previous state and, um, and the proposition of the, of the competition. Then we, we worked on this document that would be a base for all the green axes uh, for the future in this neighborhood, uh, giving the main importance and, and, yeah, and the, the three key factors uh, for the future of that street. Giving back the, um, yeah, the, the protagonism and the main importance to the people, that was like the first thing. Also, um, having an explosion of the nature and, and a more presence of, the, of trees and vegetation in that areas. And also, working on the sustainability <laughs> of that public space, working on the water circle and, and so on, no? in, the, in the soil of that street. So as you can see uh, in the left drawing, we have the previous state. Um, so there was actually more surface dedicated to the cars than to the people. And it was a, no, a segregated street and with a clear hierarchy. And now the 100% the of the space would be uh, for the people with a main platform. Here uh, is the change of the mobility as a diagram. I don't know if, can I? But they will not see my... No, um, only the people here. Yeah. <laughs> but you can do yeah, uh, so here would be the cross uh, of two green axes. No, so, yeah, exactly. Uh, two green axes where we would have a new square and the cars uh, should um, yeah, change their, their direction. And then here in terms of nature, for example, uh, we would increase at 10% the presence of, of um, trees and also the, oh, I don't know the word in, <coughs> in English, raíces? Uh, the roots. The roots. Yeah, yeah, the roots. And also giving more space, more air, and more uh, food also for the roots of that tree, of that, of that trees. It's like, uh, so here we have, no, um, graphically uh, this change in terms of nature and then in terms of sustainability, I was mentioning this uh, water circle, you not know, trying to uh, yeah, g close uh, somehow these natural dynamics in terms of water. It, it's like kind of slow, you no? Know, the, the mm. I don't know if the battery or some, yeah. And you know, here, as you can see, for example, in, in these uh, squares, we could have the possibility to, to have more area and, and work uh, on that water circle in, in a larger scale, but also in, in the linear um, streets, it's the, the proposal no? to, to also gain that water coming from the, from the um, rain and giving it back to the soil. It's like and the final proposal, uh, these are the virtual images before starting the, the construction site. As you can see, the pavement changed a little bit because there were a lot of requirements in terms of accessibility and so on. But uh, the idea of uh, having these streets uh, as a more natural spaces in terms of uh, trees and and gaining the central space for people uh, keeps keeps there no yeah. so we had uh, twenty blocks uh, in which we mm, applied these um, criteria and strategies and four um, squares sorry for the inconvenience of the 
commando. Um, we end up introducing these um, areas in the in the center of the linear trams, uh, like uh, we call them, um, yeah, sort of living spaces, but like urban living spaces, um, because we found important that not only in the um, in the intersections of the street we could find um, these bigger areas uh, with furniture and so on to to stay and and spend some time but also in the middle of this uh, 100 meter uh, long blocks so that was like more you no know, um, a key distance and somehow um, yeah, more uh, with more places to to stay in this new green axis. And we turned in our proposal, we turned those spaces. Uh, we round, yeah, we turned uh, 35 degrees as the sham chamfron. So I don't know how the to, corners. Yeah, the, the corners. Cut corners. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, as a reminiscence and also to change the perspective in that. In, in that place, no? We uh, traditionally usually uh, go fast and just uh, go through that street, but maybe if you can sit down and rest a bit or, or read or have a call or whatever you want to do there, uh, you have the opportunity to change the, um, the perspective. This is a diagram for the structural soil and what happens underneath the pavement. Uh, regarding mm, that strategy to to return the wood, the rainwater uh, below and underneath, and these are the areas where that uh, could happen in the surface. This is the the circulation diagram, and this uh, yeah this uh, new system that you will not be able to to go directly. Uh, no, straight with the car from from one point to the other. And you will have to turn uh, right or left in each um, <coughs> intersection. And these are the final plans of the um, of the street. Uh, yeah, applying all these all these strategies and so on. No? You will see like almost 20, 20 of those. Mm. And this is how Kunsel de Sen will end up. And we can discuss uh, in the following minutes furthermore the, the proposals. <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. Yvette. Uh, and we had some first questions that mm -hmm. we wanted to share with uh, Shanghai and Beijing as well. And the first one has to do with how we understand public space, how we understand public space in Europe and what or how you understand also public space uh, in Shanghai and Beijing and as I think we have already spoken about how we're understanding public space over here in Barcelona in the context of Europe I would like to ask Shan Shan maybe first and then Yu Yan uh, who have the experience of having been uh, in the United States and maybe in Europe as well uh, but also over there in China how you see differences or similarities in how public space is understood. Because we've already seen that when we speak about the super blocks, the importance of the public space, the thresholds up to the limits of the facades of the buildings are very, very uh, important. So maybe uh, Jose with Sunshine, you can begin. Yeah, so what do you think about the question of Ivan Sunshine? Okay, so personally speaking, I, I love public spaces in, in Europe, any countries in Europe, because I love to see people in Europe. But I really hate public spaces in China because it's so overcrowded. <laughs> That's just personal experience. But we're thinking how to changing, you know, um, when I go to old streets in, in China, where the living conditions are actually much more natural in a way, where old people and young people, they're communicating, that they're just doing their own thing, or even it's it's much more more relaxed for me, rather than commercial public space. And we have so much, so many commercial public 
space. They do look very、um, happy and cheerful, and everybody's shopping. But I I don't think that is that close to our experience in a way.、Um, so so I think it's it's really the scale of public space.、Um, I like to be much more、um, more tied to per- personal scale. Um, I like smaller streets,、uh, less things to happen, rather than、uh, sort of planned or designed public space for、uh, sort of a controlled programs, or even, even, even just for commercial, like re- very repeated commercial programs. Thank you very much. Let's go with Jan in in Beijing. I think it's a very very relevant question. First of all, there is no public space in China. Um, if you think of it as a, in the European、um, definition, that it you know is belong to basically everyone. This is only a side of the the sidewalk, perhaps, and perhaps the space in front of a train station. But even that is very much controlled. So when you walk through Beijing, a lot most of what you think is public space is actually owned by someone. So. It's kind of when a developer buys a piece of land, they maybe leave one meter sidewalk with a place for blind people to walk, and then you start actually the kind of 30% green strip that、um, that the developer then has to pay to the city. And of course, it lies in the architects and also in the developers' responsibility of how public and of what kind of quality space they give back to the city. Very often you see maybe just like this space in front here. You could see、uh, fences with big green bushes, so it kind of they become very impenetrable.、Um, so that that is not that is not very、um, very good. So,、um, however, I think since actually in China the only public space that you perceive is actually private owned. That means、um, there is. Actually, a much more nuanced、uh, and interesting definition of public space, I think,、um, in China. It's not so black and white as as it is, I feel,、uh, in Europe. It's either if it's private owned, even though people can go in,、um, you know, then it's not public. If you cannot go there for a demonstration, it's not public. But however, you see, actually, many public spaces in Europe also do lack quality,、um, and you actually. See that <clears throat> some public spaces here—they're very, very interesting and they're curated. They have great landscape,、um, and they can offer new hybrids、uh, or new types of spaces that you wouldn't necessarily find if they're not really owned by anyone in, in, in Europe. <coughs> so I think the, the contribution from China is really about kind of easing up that definition and blurring the boundary between what's privately owned and what's publicly owned. And also using the privately owned as a model for quality, for quality、um, public space. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Ian. Goes back to、uh, Ivan and Yvette.、Mm-hmm. Well, do you want to add something, Yvette, about public space here in Europe? Because、uh, let's not forget that where there's cars, that's also public space.、Mm. Definitely.、Um, I think I'm able to speak about Barcelona, and、uh, even in Europe there are different different examples. I think here at least because we are in the Mediterranean and culturally because of the good weather and and yeah and our culture and society, I think it's intrinsically somehow、uh, that we feel like in public space we can do a lot of activities and and. And so on, and yeah, it's true that there are also different type of of public space, and some squares work better than others.、Uh, but I think we, for us,、uh, has a, a high value, and that was very interesting. What what they were mentioning in Beijing about the public owned and privately owned public spaces. Because、uh, here in Spain, at least, the trouble is about the maintenance of that space when when it's private. You know, when the property is private but the use is public,、um, who should be the the responsible to to keep that 
space clean and and no and well maintained that's always uh, the tricky question about who who should um cost no I'll assume that that cost um yeah i think uh, this will also come up i think jose you also have a question uh yeah, um, well, the question that I, I prepare is more or less uh, discussed, no? We, we are discussing about that. Um, it's about what is a super block? Which one is your, uh, for all of you, in your experiences in your different cities, what is your understanding of, of a super block? Samson? Besides what have been uh, presented, um, I think, because as we were chatting before, you were saying that uh, in, in Barcelona, the superblocks is actually defined by transportation costs in a way that trying to more letting the uh, transportation system, the car driving uh, more efficient, that you sort of circle around one superblock that is for car speed uh, and then leaving the whole block uh, itself for living conditions, walking, bicycling, and so it's a sort of in terms of speed. Um, but uh, what what have been presented before, it's that there was no car when that way was like, existed, but it's still gigantic. Everything's by walking or bicycle because you do live within that superblock and you don't ever get out. You don't even communicate. You marry with whoever is in that super block, you know, and, and they raise kids. And so so we always call ourselves, oh, we belong to that super block. We belong, my parents are from that down way. But now um, it's even more interesting where um, you, 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 I, I do see very, very um, for example, when I go to Beijing, that super block is so uh, far away from me in a way that it really blocks me away, that I can't communicate with whoever or whatever is inside because I can't even find that gate. So so that that's sort of a very different definition for super block. And uh, for us, when we study architecture, we try to define super blocks as more, even more an uh, example for utopia life. You know, it has everything, it has mixed use, it has happiness, it has fun. So, so that's where, that's why I was looking back into sort of the countryside uh, prototype for, for super block. So sort of trying to study what could be within that super block. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think now we can go uh, to Beijing with Davide and Jan. Um, yeah, I mean, indeed, you could say, you could say that the, uh, the done way was actually a very forward uh, thinking model. It was the, the 10 minute or 15 minute city uh, realized, realized then. And then when um, when private development um, happened here, actually initially, uh, this didn't happen in gated communities. They were open as well. So it only happened after a while to kind of come back to this model also of, you know, kind of controlling a population, organizing them, that they were, that they were gated again. So, um, and this again led back to the, to the roadblocks. There was a couple of years ago, I think, um, an attempt by, uh, by the city government to say, okay, we have no more gated communities and we have to open them up. And of course, this met a lot of protests from the owners of, um, of places when they said, okay, well, now we're going to have a road or walkway opening through your, through your community, through your compound, because obviously people are maybe concerned about... Um, about uh, security, people might also be concerned about other people using facilities that they have paid for. So this really is actually quite an interesting topic um, that I don't know how you resolve that. And actually, this is what, what uh, actually is my biggest question about this uh, very nice project you guys are doing in, 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 in Barcelona. Um, how you also talk to stakeholders um, because, for example, if you're a shop owner on a street and all of a sudden you can't park in front anymore, you might lose some customers. So perhaps you're not so happy about um, pedestrianizing, um, pedestrianizing everything, even though, of course, it looks very beautiful. And, you know, this is also about a commercial life where basically you walk through there and you have a cafe, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it's an interesting kind of question about this, uh, these ownership issues that are very much intrinsically linked to the, to the issue of, of public space. So how did you manage to do that in, in Spain? Uh, that's a good question. I forgot to mention that actually uh, cars are not banned in this in these streets. So the people who own uh, shops or the neighborhood, the yeah the neighbors who live there, are able to to get to their own places by by car. Um, so there's actually a coexistence of uh, different mobilities in in the same space. Um, which definitely will have to learn how to how to yeah coexist with those cars and and the pedestrians who will be um, the main the main users of that uh, area from now on. But definitely, the cars uh, are yeah sort of guests in that places, and they will have to to go very slowly. As the as the the other uh, no the Shan Shan mentioned here in Barcelona the superblock, it's true that it's very related to to pacifying that that urban spaces, and and about the mobi the mobility and the speeds uh, as she already mentioned no so cars should go at maximum ten kilometers uh, per hour so that's like really slow. And, and the priority would be for for pedestrian uh, no, at, at uh, walking v velocity or yeah or speed or speed, speed yeah um, but definitely you can't no uh, probably uh, it's it's impossible to 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 admit and it has to be solved that shops, supermarkets and and all the you know, activities that are happening at the ground floor have their deliveries and so on and elder people might um, be able to 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 get their homes uh, by a taxi or by their, their own car and there are parkings and private parkings and so on and and, and those access will not be um, banned at all but we all will have to learn that that space uh, is not at least just for us anymore and and we have to to coexist with these uh, different realities no uh, specifically in the Champel neighborhood as as Ivan already said it's a very dense neighborhood and so a lot of people live there and the public space is is limited so um, originally, the interior of the blocks uh, should have been public, but um, no. In the end, uh, they they are filled and occupied by um, yeah by by other activities. So the public space in that neighborhood are the streets, and and that is the the exercise that no that the the council is trying to do. Uh, to to gain more public space in in a place where it's not possible to to to, to have it in an in another area, no, and yeah, and it's very demanded. Allow me to add also that uh, these examples, these tests, have been taking place since the 90s in cities such as Barcelona, in which streets, which were full of cars, have become for uh, places for pedestrians and. As usual, in the city of Barcelona, people discuss and are against, and we are kind of very fierce against uh, things at the very beginning. But that is also what builds up the city. And it not uh, everybody uh, kind of agrees with how uh, certain aspects of the superblocks are taken uh, forward. But there are examples in which people that had their shops and thought that they would lose uh, people buying and so on, in the these older uh, projects and so on, uh, finally it showed that they do have uh, or the same number of people attending these uh, commercial areas or even more people because it becomes, and then the problems are others. There's problems with gentrification and so on, but that's another issue. So Davide, I would also like to uh, give the word to you. No, and uh, oh, sorry. sorry, yeah, I, w I would like to ask, to add that we are all very critics with with the with the changes at the beginning, as as you as you already said, no? Because definitely we'll have to we'll have to adapt and and change our 
ways of understanding that spaces and, and probably change some habits. And, and that's always complicated, no? Because we are very comfortable doing uh, what we also do. And, and it's not easy to change that things. But yeah, here, at least in Barcelona, we have other examples of other commercial streets that previously cars were allowed there and, and, and they changed to pedestrian areas. And, and actually the shops, uh, it's demonstrated that uh, gain even, even more and they, their activities uh, are growing and go better. And, and I think that if now we would go to that shoppers and say, no, now that street will uh, have cars again and will go uh, backwards, they would probably be against that now. But they were against uh, to the reconversion of the pedestrian no, uh, some years before. So personally, I think we are always against that uh, changes um, as, a, as a natural position at the beginning. Um, but then time, uh, hopefully, uh, will we'll have the answer. David, back to you. <laughs> Thanks to two of you. Indeed, I think we are mostly change resistant. Then, after a little bit of time, habits tend to change again. However, Yvette Ward's were exactly uh, nailing the the topic of my question was about banning cars. But rather than banning cars, the question was about banning private transportation. Whether this can happen, makes sense or not. I just want to add one little detail before uh, uh, leaving the, the the microphone to Ian. Uh, it's of course a bit of a, to me, it's a bit of a chicken egg problem. Can we ban cars or not? Because we are always, always referring to cars in terms of uh, um, pollution makers, noise makers, potentially uh, accident makers. And, and But then we go in contrast with people have it. I want to have my car, drive my car, uh, go door to door from my own home to my uh, workplace. The, the little uh, brick I want to add to the world of the conversation is also that the European Parliament a couple of weeks ago made the first attempt to ban selling cars uh, from 20, uh, 2035 onwards, and I mean cars with traditional engine uh, uh, fueled by oil. So it, it's also in terms of which kind of energy are we going to use in the future, probably not just about car, if it is private, public, if it is electric or not. It, it's a matter of also of uh, energy, how much energy we can still. Uh, dig out of, uh, of oil, for example, so from uh, fossil energy. So I'm trying to open up a bit, not to stay only on the car, yes, no. And I leave to Ian now. Okay, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a, it's a I, I think maybe it's not so much about whether you should have a car or not, but especially when you compare to Shanghai, I've lived there as well, um, and I go there very often, compared to Beijing, it's actually practical to have a car in Beijing, and you can get reasonably well from A to B. In Shanghai it's impossible because it's, I mean, it's it's crazy. The streets are very small because of the, you know, European footprint, especially in, in old areas. And it's also very, very difficult actually to own a parking lot. So it's actually a truism that, you know, before that, even when I went to university, it, it was like this. If you have bigger streets, you will have more cars. If you have more parking lots, you will have more cars. If you have smaller streets, you will have less cars. So it actually starts with, uh, with city planning. So in, in Shanghai, they don't actually even need to ban or control the purchasing of cars um, as much as, as, they do, as they do in Beijing. I think it's more natural. There's a very good uh, public transport there. And, um, and the 15-minute city there works reasonably well that you can get by without owning a car, where it's, it's much more difficult, especially with kids um, in, in Beijing, which is more of a, of a car city. So actually disallowing it, I think, is, is wrong. It's actually about improving public transport. And uh, secondly, also just somewhat reducing, creating areas that have uh, that have less car traffic in it. We're here very close to San Turn. It's basically now also, because of a small footprint, almost impossible to, to, to drive there. So I assume less people 
drive that. And that, that is the solution um, for me, because what we really need to do is, you know, is of course this change in, in transport habits throughout the world. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Shan Shan, or uh, no, let's go to Shan Shan first with her take on this. <coughs> Shan Shan, the question is about the, the private cars. Cars. Yeah. Mm. The relationship with the transportation in the city. Yeah. It's it's kind of crazy. Um, with with cars, I, I'm a promoter for bicycles and, and public transportation. And the, with private cars, it, it's 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 really hard. With with the pop, population here, it, it's very different from what, what's in Europe. And the public, um, especially with the you know how our cities are created with the traffic. It's it's not just the population itself, but with the programs, the public programs, sub specifically hospitals. Um, hospitals are always located in the very center of the city, uh, and they're sort of a state on uh, where everybody who sort of giving so much credit to them. So everybody is coming into this super center place for hospital, uh, starting from eight o'clock in the morning, and uh, along with the school systems. So that's what's created uh, super traffic. Uh, uh, beyond besides, uh, you just normally go to working hours. So, so that, that's, that's a big cause. And now we're talking about public programs and, and those sort of are, are, are the cause for, uh, so, so with Superblocks maybe, but it's hard to really have uh, hospitals and schools and, and all those uh, sort of necessary programs that are needed to attach to Superblocks because people's mental sort of creditation are not even though you do have these hospitals or, or, or healthcare places with those super blocks, but people are still coming into the very center to create traffic and with car. And when you go to hospital, you have to have a car with one person driving, one person going to the... So, so it's, it's really a, a whole sort of a, a domino system. Thank you very much, Sansan. What do you think in, in Barcelona, Ivan? Oh, and Yvette? <laughs> If you, do, do, no. You're the guest. Um, thanks. Um, to ask mm, to ban the cars uh, is such a strong word, and and probably it's not an option, and it's it's not a possibility. Um, what we have to do is what I was what I was saying before. Uh, we have to to adapt and coexist. So. Uh, they will not disappear, and and there are services that uh, need the the car or the van or or wherever to 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 work or to transport, and and the thing about the the private cars and the private transportation, uh, it's a balance, no, between time uh, probably <laughs> and and commodity or comfort, and. Personally, and yeah, that's that's uh, uh, my point of view. What would probably work better would be a combination of transports, no? So may maybe uh, depending on the on the day, I I go by bike or I go uh, walking somewhere or or I use uh, the public transport uh, with a combination of of another private transport that could be a bike, a motorbike, or maybe a car, sometimes. No, the, the problem probably is that, um, yeah, depending on the connections or, or, or the time that you use to go from one place to another, uh, you, you might use the, the private or the public transportation, but a combination of all these possibilities uh, would be probably mm, no, the most um, the most natural to to use. Definitely improve the public transport and and at least have that uh, public option uh, should be um, uh, is very important. Um, mm, 
but yeah, no. now now I think we are starting to to go faster with the public transport and and the bike, especially than the the private transport, at least here in Barcelona. So maybe when that would happen, uh, people will start uh, changing their their mobility habits. Yeah, actually, 30 years ago, we all imagined, we all remember seeing images of Shanghai or Beijing and with full of people using their bikes to go everywhere. And here in Europe, it was the car. And this is kind of changing a little bit, not the image totally, because that image was very, very powerful. No, everybody on bikes and so on. But, uh, but still, uh, this that you're seeing uh, right now, Yvette, no, the use of bicycles and other systems which might kind of leave more space for other uh, transport systems uh, might be of a certain importance or interest uh, regarding cities which obviously have grown, such as Shanghai or Beijing. But I think also, Jose, you have some other questions? Or, or David? I think it's Jose. Yeah. I go, I go. Ivan. Yeah. <laughs> I have one question, and um, it's about the, the mixed-use mix typology. Um, here in China, it has been the, the way of development, the, the new areas of the city. Um, and also in Barcelona, there is, we have, for example, Lilla. It's, it's a mixed-use space that is very near Roca Gallery. Um, and these kind of spaces, they are spaces that they are public, but at the same time, they are private owner and also is a private management. And it doesn't exist a social rule for the organization of these spaces. No? So my question is, um, which, which role do you think that, uh, Sansan, uh, which role do you think that this kind of spaces is playing in, in the cities that we are living? Um, mixed use and, and also public and private owned in a way, um, I think there, are, there there's a quite specific balance uh, in between um, that should be rich. Um, because here, the problem here right now, um, it, there are many problems. That, uh, for example, one type is uh, one gigantic super block, for example, which is right outside of Shanghai right here. It's a gigantic super block with all commercial and it's sort of all equal large commercial areas, which actually leaves the streets sort of empty with cars. So it's just car and big buildings. And what's happening is mixed use. But it's not that exciting. And uh, another type is much smaller scale uh, with, with, with programs that you, you, you can't even think of. You know, it's, it's sort of a, from bottom to up grow. Um, and and there, there are little private stores and private, uh, very unique boutique uh, areas. And I think that those are much more mixed for me uh, than um, those sort of planted mixed use areas. Yeah, and um, and also, and the third, which I find super interested, which is happening in my city, own city, uh, Hangzhou. Um, it, it's a tourist city, and with with lots of promoted uh, sort of night markets, and you would think the whole street is is very vivid and uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 grown as uh, organically grown, but actually they're not. They're planted. They, they are they're government controlled. Um, they're, they're called walking cities or, or just um, no cars going through. But they are very sort of, uh, they're, they're much more like statues of walking, walking streets or statues of um, a night market. It, it's, it's, and what they sell is also sort of organized. And, and that's the sort of a, have a shell of organic mixed use, but it's not. So we're going through many different, very interesting phases. Uh, outside, you think it's very mixed use, it's very uh, vivid, but, but actually you don't, you don't find that um, quite good balance, yeah. Thank you very much, San San. Uh, let's go to Beijing with uh, Jan. So, of course, I think real mixed-use spaces that work need open spaces for walking. This is this is very important. I mean, shopping malls are, are not that. You know, they're, they're interior spaces, um, and it's a different environment. You, but they're not that. But uh, I think uh, commercial mixed-use spaces that are privately owned but have outdoor streets, um, they 
they work because I, I venture to say that even if it's public owned, there's just still always someone who manages how people have to behave and where, when they have to close their door, um, when they have to put their, you know, tables in. So for me, um, for me, often times, you know, I feel maybe um, it does require uh, a management to bring different interests um, together. Um, and so in that sense, I think it's, it's very, it's very successful, especially for example, the, the Changdu project, um, I, I showed this would be something that would be quite difficult to do, for example, in my hometown in, 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 in Germany, where, um, actually you see many, many shops just leave, um, the city centers, uh, they're suffering, um, you know, actually from shopping malls and, uh, the space that is public, you know, becomes, you know, not, not nice mm -hmm. if uh, actually there's no shops in there or there's basically no life in there. So this is kind of going hand in hand. Sometimes it does require uh, a private manager to make sure that you have a good mix. Otherwise, everyone will just rent their spaces to whoever pays more, even though perhaps it doesn't contribute anything to a successful uh, interesting um, life or you know even a, a good mix that is meaningful to the people who live within the 10 meter radius this somehow needs to be managed right mm. thanks Jan Barcelona yeah I, I agree with the previous words and and I find this there is an interesting feel uh, at least here in in Barcelona an interesting feel to explore in in this uh, mixed use and public and private properties uh, use because uh, i find yeah i find it it should work or it works well when when no, they are both related but the thing is that the the private uh, properties probably don't want to to pay the maintenance of that public spaces anymore because they they you know they find or they think that if they sort of give this gift to the city and and to the public space uh, and it's already sort of a loose for them in terms of of the surface that they can explode um no then the cost of the maintenance shouldn't be assumed for them and and there is a dialogue here <laughs> uh, that should be should be start between the private properties and and the council or the or the public um, organizations to to agree in in what to do and then probably the the private um, stakeholders or owners uh, should be more active um, giving part of the of the of their space for the for the city, I think. Thank you very much. I think David has the last question. Yes, we have one more, which is also the last question. And uh, so we start from here be in Beijing with uh, Ian. So you said earlier on, if you cannot demonstrate in a place mm. in Europe, of course, this is not public. Yeah. So the question is, in your experience, I would say now here in China, how do people get ownership of public space? How they, the, the normal people in the daily routine, how do they interact with the public space? How do they make them their space if this happens? Um, well, that's a good, that's that that's that's a very good question. I mean, what I what I like to do is if I do go to a park, which is which is public, it's just to try to find a bench, you know, and sit there and do a public, and do a, do a picnic. Um, I I love looking at people, uh, you know, dancing. I love looking at people hanging up their birds and bringing them from their apartments to to give to give them some air. Um, I think these are these are all. Uh, you know, square dancing, these are all very lovely traditions that we don't really see in, in Europe um, as, um, as, as such. Um, but of course, you see a lot here as people taking, taking photos of uh, spaces that are beautiful, that maybe, you know, that, that have an interesting architecture, have an interesting design, or have a shop front. So 
there's an enormous um, Instagram culture um, here, which seems to be part of this appropriating, um, appropriating public space, which um, somewhat um, you know mer merges into the into the uh, on online world. Um, so that is also a kind of interesting experience, um, I would say. There is also digital yeah. footprint on the on the public space. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, so we we'll go for to Barcelona first now. <laughs> cool. Um, well, I think there's a huge diversity uh, on how people um, no, appropriate these public spaces uh, here in, in in Barcelona, and and it depends a lot on each of us and and our and our daily life. But uh, I mean, for us, I think mainly it's a social space and. And, and yeah, it's it's a, it's an area to to do some activities. Of course, you can also do whatever you want uh, by your own and 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 be alone, no. But but somehow uh, the public space is under under the under the eyes of all of us, and and no, it creates somehow this sense of community of being in in the city context and not in the in the middle of 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 nature and and i don't know i mean to me it's very it's very personal and there's a, a huge variety of of options um but yeah yeah. And probably also here in the south of Europe, in the Mediterranean area, how people appropriate these spaces is or has been uh, traditionally different, maybe from the center part of Europe or the northern uh, part of Europe, the northern part, which has to do with climate. But with climate mm. change, we're also seeing how this is changing and it's being appropriated differently in Germany, in ne the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, and even uh, Nor Norway, uh, Copen uh, Denmark, and so on. Yeah, sometimes I, 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 I get really surprised that in those countries uh, the public space is more sort of equipped or for example for ch for children or so on, they have like uh, much more interesting spaces and, and so on than here that that we definitely have the climate which is everything probably no to 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 joy no and and be able to use that exterior spaces and and for them most of the times the climate is not an is not a problem they just uh, get the well dressed and and they have that that yeah. possibility no and and in that sense i think we we still have a lot to learn and and to improve uh, in terms of the public space. So, Shan Shan. Okay, sure. I guess there are two things I want to share. First is because of the rapid change here in um, in our cities, because you know new towns being built and new areas being built, new buildings being built, new streets. Um, so, first of all, we have to. Um, the old public space are being demolished and we have to get used to the new spaces in a way. So it's an adjustment of how we use it. So when I travel around within China, there are many new towns being built, but then you see it's so empty. You know, the, the population is not decreasing, but then the streets are so empty because people are not used to it. But then the second things are coming up is how do we define public space since there's so many regulations of what we can do and we cannot do. For example, we cannot sort of having uh, um, many people events outside of the street. We, we can have parades. We can have many things that are crazily happening in Europe or in the U.S. Um, but what we can do is sort of, for example, you can hang your clothes outside of the building and then people just hang things out. And it's public space visually. Um, but then we define, uh, culturally, we define that as a private space. So it's it's very, very different ways of uh, appropriate space uh, how do we we sort of sneak around to see what we can use and sort of trying to push the boundaries in, in, in many interesting ways thank you very much it, it, it's true that that here in in, in china in shanghai in, in the communities you can see how all people they appropriate the space they bring the chairs outside they are all the 
all the time outside the home and in the new spaces they are hiding no it's like they they are scared of of using it or or making it but um so i don't know if there is a, a question from the audience in barcelona i think yeah so we have one question um i don't have the mic but if sila yeah, you can speak and then I will... Ah, sorry, we have the mic over there. So we have a question, last question from here, Barcelona. Hello. Uh, my name is Pablo Varelio. I'm a tech journalist. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, uh, I recently saw uh, some statistics that, you know, in China in the last 10 years, they have used more concrete than the United States in a century. So they are building and building and building. So this is, and the same thing that happened probably before, in, and I think you mentioned that uh, recently, is that uh, we had the image of people in China just moving around in bikes. And about 30 years ago, I think uh, most of the experts, they thought that this was going to continue. So, and then they moved to cars. Do you think that China has made in the past 20 years, the same mistakes that we made in the last century in terms of mobility and the use of, for example, private uh, mobility options? And what, is, what are the challenges of these very, very fast moving in construction? And, and, and that creates other problems with uh, climate change, with uh, the use of energy and things like that. Thank you. So I think we could make uh, or ask Sanshan to answer this question as we have two questions and we would like to maybe have them both. So it's this issue of the speed that you were speaking about, you no, know, and how things have changed so fastly and there's some mistakes which, will, uh, which have probably uh, been uh, committed, uh, which are the same ones that probably here in Europe or the States have been also uh, done or have taken place in the last century. So, Shanshan, maybe yeah. you can answer yeah, from your very experience. Very good question. It's, it's actually, it's, it's been cycles in a way. Uh, and also, so for example, when you're talking about uh, people buying cars and uh, what's the transportation type we prefer to use, uh, for my generation, we, of course, we, we have already gone through this private-owned car period of time, and now we, we, we want to throw the car away, we want to buy bicycles, we want to live as as close as possible, but then um, the generation a little higher than me uh, with, with kids to go to school and, and just because of their facilities, they have to move further away in a way. So they, because the cities are being growing much bigger and they have to pick up the kids by on time. So they're sort of being forced to have a car else they have no option. Um, so, so, so there is this sort of cycling around, and then when uh, new new people come into the city, they're sort of trying, still trying to have a goal of only a car, first car. So, so there are sort of in, uh, people are in different stages, all sharing the same areas. That is quite interesting. That's what's happening now. Rather than 20, like ten years ago, everybody wants a car, and the cities are expanding. But here has uh, right now. It does have a very a variety of different voices. Thank you very much, Sansan. And so we have the second question from Barcelona. Do you hear him? But uh, there are three axes that I would like to make some, some reflections. Uh, you talk about the uh, use of the car in the city, but uh, that it's not an individual decision. <coughs> and, uh, the problem is that usually uh, it's uh, interpreted as individual decision. In Barcelona, if you take the, uh, the uh, numbers from the city council, we can see that the, uh, uh, the car use uh, from uh, citizens of Barcelona is less than 25%. Uh, All the other is coming from uh, the metropolitan area. But the problem is not the use of the uh, uh, public space. The problem is 
uh, how we manage the uh, public services that are absolutely uh, insufficient. Mm. Uh, this, this is uh, one question. The, the other question is, uh, uh, you talk several times about the uh, mixed use of the public space, but what does it mean, mixed use? Uh, because we focus only on a very uh, few and specific um, uh, types of activities, but not real mixed, because uh, part of our problem comes from the, um, the time that the, 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 the modernity was the, uh, the zoning of the city. Then um, maybe we have to, uh, to change that. Uh, and the last uh, is uh, uh, about the well public space. It's public. It's a public. We appropriate about the space of the city or no? Uh, which these are uh, uh, psychosocial uh, processes that have to be uh, taken in account in uh, this analysis and and in this uh, planification. Then we uh, you planify uh, public space without public without. Uh, social dynamics without persons that will use uh, this space, uh, that we can improve our uh, results if we take in consideration that. And that is not new. That started in the 60s and the 70s. Then uh, we uh, risk to reinvent the uh, rule each time. But uh, I think it is interesting to include in the mixed uh, things to planify uh, all the new propositions. It was only a focus. No, thank you very much, because I think it's uh, three very interesting reflections, which I think we cannot answer either, unfortunately. I mean, there's things that we have to discuss, and that we have to discuss also with stakeholders, with uh, decision makers, politicians, and, and so on. But I think that, that we all mm -hmm. agree that public transport has to be thought in the big scale of the metropolitan areas all over, and probably this is also somehow different between the scale of uh, uh, China cities, Chinese cities, and, and European cities. Unless, Jan, maybe you want to say something, or if not, we would leave it here because we've run out of time. We, we actually couldn't hear very well, okay. to be honest. So it would be very, very difficult also to, to provide an answer to such an articulated question. We only could get the articulation of it, but not, uh, what not we'll, the content, to be we'll honest. Try to, what we'll try to do is to share it with you afterwards, okay? It's because it was really, uh, yes. I think, very, also very interesting. Also from a sociological point of view, a non-architect uh, that has a knowledge from the University of Barcelona here on the uh, sociological aspects of uh, urban uh, space, public space, and also mixed use uh, of the buildings, but also of the public spaces themselves. So, Davide, I think. I think, yes, I think it's now my turn to draw this meeting to a conclusion, as well as the overall event. So I want to, first of all, say thank you to Roca and uh, to Jasmine, which is in me, which is the manager of the Roca Gallery, Gallery here in Beijing, as well as, of course, uh, Shanghai and, uh, and Barcelona. Again, a big thank you goes to our guests, Ian with me, Shan Shan and Yvette, as well as the guests we had in the previous two uh, afternoons in which we met and we discussed all the, those interesting topics. And further thank you goes, of course, to Ivan and the Miss Van der Rohe Foundation for uh, having been such uh, a, a lovely partner in this venture, which my colleague Jose has been pushing uh, since uh, December, I think, or, or Jen, sort of. He has been in my office regularly every <laughs> week to convince me to do this, and we made it happen. So he, he made a, a huge effort and a, a huge work from his side. And uh, one last comment, one last thank you goes from my side to the technical team, to the technicians of the Xianjiatong Liverpool University who have been working behind the scenes to make happen the, um, the um, <coughs> exhibition there in Shanghai. So all those three units have been uh, working together. I think it's been quite a successful uh, cooperation. And uh, I leave now to Jose to say something from, from, from Shanghai. 
so to complete the Chinese chapter of this uh, three, uh, threefold connection. Thank you very much, Davide. Um, I have to apologize, uh, uh, Sansan, because you had to run. We, we were getting very long and she was missing the last train because she has to come back to Hanzhou. So thank you very much um, to Sansan. Thank you very much also to Yvette and thank you very much to Jan. Um, I would like to thank also all the all the people that they have been possible they have been possible to do this this exhibition and this event. Uh, I mean Irene, uh, Katrina, uh, Jasmine from Roca Gallery, Mark also um, from Mies Foundation, uh, Ana Ramos who is the president, Ana Sala uh, and and of course Ivan. Um, from the university, of course, Davide, because as he was saying, I was pushing a lot and he was very supportive all the time. He never said no. Um, also, all the people from the lab, from the FAP lab, uh, with Jan and with um, Lichon in the head, that they were making all the, all the work for the exhibition. And I pass to, to Ivan. So thank you, Jose and Davide, obviously to your university, to the San Jiantong Liverpool University, who have also pushed this uh, to be possible together with the Roca, uh, uh, Barcelona, Shanghai, and Beijing galleries. And uh, we are a team working at the Mies van der Rohe Foundation. So a huge thank you to the whole team here, to the teams at the university, at the teams in Shanghai, Beijing, obviously to you, Jan, and also Shansen, and as Davide was saying, to all our previous guests that have helped us discuss and share a little bit more knowledge. We have to constantly do this. We should do it even more possibly on what's happening in other places so that we can continue learning. And obviously that is also uh, absolutely, it is absolutely necessary. Also, Yvette, I forgot you because you're just here. Hi, but that's also, uh, it's also necessary to share that directly in person here with the people that we had in the audience today. So thanking and hoping that we haven't forgotten uh, anybody. Uh, we kind of closed this uh, event, the three sessions plus the exhibition back there in Shanghai plus the videos in Beijing uh, with public space and the super blocks. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.